right, and now we're going to take a look at who? Solomon and the Song of Solomon. Uh, the last three weeks have mostly been introductions, uh, but today we're going to take another look at it, and you're going to see some things that you may not have seen before. It's kind of fun, just like you detail a car, to detail the scriptures, to really look at each little detail and see if there's any little nugget that we can find that may not have been there before. But uh, also, if you open up your, if you want to, you can open your Bibles as well to the Song of Solomon. This isn't on your notes per se, but I'm just going to read the first couple of verses just because of where we're picking up here. Last week we uh, touched on verse 2 and 3 is all the verses we touched last week. But today uh, we're going to try to go through the entire chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to try to cover maybe a chapter uh, a week. But let's take a look here. It began as we saw in verse 2. It, she is speaking here. And she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you? And we talked about that last week. And then what's fascinating here in verse. I have here a song of Solomon one verse four. She goes on to say, draw who draw me. But then she says, we will run after you. It doesn't say, I will run after you. I think that's fascinating when you look at it. First, she says, draw me. And then it's like she's unsure. So she says, all of us are going to run after you. And then all of a sudden, you see this interjection where it says, the king has brought me in to his chambers. Okay. So then she goes on to say this. She says, we will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. The upright love you. So you kind of see some interesting things here. Nowhere does she profess her love for him. It's always a group effort. Okay? It's, she's not saying, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will remember your love more than wine. And that's why I love you. Okay? It's, it's more of a, a group thing you see going on here. And what's fascinating to me is she says, the king has brought me into his chambers But then she says, we will be glad and rejoice in you. It doesn't say we will be glad and rejoice in him. So I don't believe this is referring to the king. I believe, again, like I said from the beginning, that this is the story of God whose name is truly exalted and why and whose name she loves more than anything else. She's drawing him away. He is trying to draw her away from the king. So when she says the king has brought me into his chambers, I see it more like this. She's yelling out to the shepherd, help. Okay. It's like here, the king has brought her into his chambers in the castle. And she's yelling out to the shepherd, hey, but we love you. And then in verse 5 and 6, she goes on to say this. I am black, but comely. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem. So who's she speaking to? The daughters of Jerusalem. And then she says, I'm black like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look on me that I am black. The sun has looked upon me. Then she says, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard I haven't kept. Well, this is loaded loaded with stuff. I don't know if it's jumping out at you yet. But first off, let's look at the tents of Kedar. She says, I am black like the tents of Kedar. What in the world is that? Well, it's interesting as I went online and uh, to the Armenian house. And right here, this is exactly what I got off of their website. It says, here is a Kurdish encampment. The black tents are those of Kurdish tribes who spend the winter in the mountain villages And come down for the spring and the summer to feed their flocks on the plains. They are spoken of in the Bible as the tents of Kedar. I think Kedar and Kurdish. Kind of interesting tie in there. But there's some things that's going to jump out at you here. uh, I think uh, this week, more next week. But notice that the black tents are the Kurdish tribes who spend the winter in the mountain villages. And then catch this. They come down for spring and summer to do what? Okay. Now, you're going to see some very interesting tie-ins. But just kind of remember that. 
Okay, now let's let's break this out a little bit. In Ezekiel sixteen fourteen, it says, "And your renown went forth among the heathen for your beauty, for it was perfect through whose comeliness." My comeliness. God says, it's my comeliness, which I had put on you. And here she's saying, uh, I am black but comely. But she has to realize, it's whose comeliness is it? It's Messiah's. And then we also see here, she says her own vineyard, she hasn't kept it, has she? And she's also blaming others, pointing the finger. But we see here in Isaiah 5, a very interesting parallel, because this is a song that's being sung. And in Isaiah, it's the same thing. And she always refers to him as what? My love. And he refers to her as my beloved. And here it says, I will sing a, to my beloved a song of my beloved. And then it says concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a tower in its midst. Hewed out a wine fat in it. He looked for it to produce grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O people of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Who knows? I look forward to yield grapes, but it brought forth rotten grapes. So here we see a perfect picture of Israel who was not taking care of her vineyard. She hasn't kept it. And all too often that speaks of us today as well. In Isaiah 5, 7, we see the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is who? The house of Israel. And here we just got done reading in verse 9, my own vineyard I have not kept. It says, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, bloody iniquity for righteousness, but behold, a cry. See, all this is tying right into what we talked earlier about this morning. And now look at this. Who are, who is Kadar? And who are the, what are the tents of Kadar? Well, what do we find here in Genesis 25, 13? It says, these are the names of the sons of who? Their names, according to their generations, the firstborn of Ishmael was Nebaioth and who? So we see Kadar comes from Ishmael's line. Now, the other way, you always let Scripture interpret Scripture. You're safer that way. And look what the Bible says concerning the tense of Kadar to get an association here. In Psalms 120, verses 1 through 7, here is another song. And it says, In my trouble I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from what? From lying lips a deceitful tongue, what shall be given to you? Or what shall be done to you, O false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of broom. Woe is me that I live in Meshech and I dwell in the tents of Kadar. My soul is long dwelt with a hater of peace. I am for priests, but when I speak, they are for war. And so the tents of Kadar are relating to a false tongue, lying lips. The, this is the correlation between the two. And where it says here in Psalms 120, the tents of Kadar, I put down the Hebrew word for tent here, and it is ohel. Uh, it's the aleph, the hay, and the lamed. Okay? Now that's one name for tent. But now let's go and look at Isaiah 60, verse 5 and 7. What will be the end of the story? It says, then you shall see and flow together and your heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea will be converted to you. Now, when it says the sea, what does the sea always refer to? The nations. Okay. And it says the forces of the Gentiles shall come to you. So there's telling you the sea refers to the nations. Now, this is a whole nother side thought I'm just throwing in here. In Revelation, it talks about a beast that arises from where? The sea. But then there's another beast that arises from the earth. And earth always, or land, Eretz, refers to Israel. So in Revelation, there's really two beasts. One that's coming up from the sea, which refers to the nations, and another beast that's coming up out of the land of Israel. And so I believe that this really is a parallel. You have to be... You know, looking at this, one of these days, I'll kind of teach you guys a different view of Revelation you may have heard before. But then it says the multitude of camels will cover you. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They will bring gold and incense. They shall show forth for the praises of the Lord. And then it says all the flocks of Kadar will be gathered unto you. 
Okay, so it's talking about the the thing they're going to repent and things are going to be coming. And uh, the other thing that we that she said, she said, the sun has looked upon me. Remember that verse? Well, what should that remind us of? But Second Kings 23, verse four and five. Where it talks about Josiah, he commanded Hilkiah, the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord, all the vessels that were made for Baal, for the grove, for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them to Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the city of Judah and in the places around Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal to what else? To the sun, to the moon, to the planets, to all the hosts of heaven. I believe when she's speaking about the sun has looked upon me, it's like she's been worshiping all the hosts of heaven and she's, uh, she realizes that she is black, that she realizes that she ha- is an idolater. And then what do we find here in the Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1, verse 7? She goes on and listen to what she says here. She says, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where you feed, where you make your flocks to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turns aside by the flocks of your companions? And so here, the other reason why I don't believe that this is Solomon is he just got done saying the king has brought her into his chambers. She knows who the king is. She knows what his job description is. But now she's someone she's talking about whom she loves. She claims to love, but she doesn't know where he feeds uh, or makes his flock to rest at noon. So again, that's why I think these are two completely different people. But what's amazing to me, too, is, and this is so much like the body of Messiah today, they're only interested in when they're going to (laughs) eat. And look at this. And where do you make your flocks to rest at noon? I want to make sure I come at lunchtime, and I want to make sure that I don't want to have to work. I just just want to come, be fed at lunchtime, uh, but for, you know, rest time. She's not interested in in working the harvest. She's not interested in in the, the work that's involved. But she doesn't know where he feeds. But you're going to find that this changes. Later on in the story, she realizes where he feeds. Uh, But then she also has the gall to say, and and if you don't tell me, I just may go somewhere else. Look at that. That's what she says. Why should I be as one that turns aside by the flocks of your companions? So you can see this real turmoil, this indecisiveness within her. In, um, let me see, I'm not going to interject this right here right now okay so now let's go on and so now the daughters of jerusalem are the ones that respond here remember she was talking to the daughters of jerusalem and now in uh, chapter one uh, verse eight it says this they, they say to her well if you don't know O fairest among women why don't you follow the footsteps of the flock and feed your kids besides the shepherd's tents So in other words, why don't you start taking care of your own garden? Why don't you start taking care of your flocks and begin to follow in his footsteps? And then what's uh, interesting is the word tent here. Remember for the tents of Kedar, it was Ohel? (laughs) This time it's Mishkan. And when you hear the word Mishkan, what do you think of? Moses' tabernacle. Okay, the Mishkan is almost exclusively used for Moses' tabernacle, the Shekinah glory and the Mishkan, same root word. Now, sometimes Moses' tabernacle was called an Ohel as well. But I think it's interesting here within the context. And also, what do we see? Uh, the daughters of Jerusalem are trying to tell the, the bride-to-be what she needs to do. And I think it's fascinating in Luke 16, 8, here it talks about the Lord commending the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And how true that is here in context. It's like she doesn't know what to do and the daughters of Jerusalem have to tell her. And then if you remember, she wants to know where to feed the flock. And if, uh, look at First Peter 5, 2 through 4. What does God want us to do? Feed the flock of God among you. Take the oversight, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for base gain, but readily, not as lording it over those allotted to you by God, but become examples to the flock. So that when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a never feeding crown of glory. So you you see in the Song of Solomon, Solomon is the king. 
But there's a shepherd that's out there that's the chief shepherd that's trying to woo her away from an earthly king that he didn't want them to have to begin with. And we see in John 21, 16, when he's, after he had risen from the dead, he's talking to Peter and he said to them the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so he said to him, what? Feed my sheep. I mean, this is a theme that you see carried all throughout the scripture. So now the question is this, who are the daughters of Jerusalem? Who can tell me who Jerusalem's parents were? Can anyone tell me who Jerusalem's parents were or who their sisters are? Yeah, yeah, you're going to, yeah. Who are her parents? Well, let's take a look and we're going to see. To understand who the daughters of Jerusalem are, we have to look at the scriptures and we'll find out. In chapter 16 of Ezekiel, verse 1 through 3, it says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, so says the Lord Jehovah to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth is of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. OK, so historically, that's who remember it was called Jebus before it was called Jerusalem. I believe before it was Jebus, it was called Salem. But before that, it was probably called something else. But that's where it came into being. Uh, evidently an Amorite married a Hittite, and they founded the city many years before. And what's fascinating is Ezekiel 16, 44, within the same context of that chapter, it says, Behold, everyone that uses Proverbs who uses Proverbs against you, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. And so, in other words, Jerusalem is acting like the Hittites and the Amorites. But now let's look at this. In Ezekiel 16, Verse 45 and 46. I have this map here because I want you to think of something. Here is Jerusalem. Okay. Now the temple face which direction? That's over here. Okay. And so there's north, there's south. Now if you're facing east, north is to your left, south is to your right. And what do we see here? Samaria is to the north and Sodom is to the right when you're facing east. And look what it says in Ezekiel 16, 45 and 46. He goes on to say, you are your mother's daughter who despises her husband. See, just like Israel, God was married unto her and she despises her husband and her sons. And you are the sister of your sisters. And that's going to bring in sisters here who despise their husbands and their sons. Your mother was a Hittite. Your father was an Amorite. And your older sister is Samaria. She and her daughters who dwell at your left hand and your younger sister who dwells at your right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. And now let's go on and let's look at Ezekiel 16, 48 to 52. God says, as I live, says the Lord Jehovah, Sodom, your sister, she nor her daughters have not done as you have done. You and your daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. We read this earlier. It went on about was the fullness of bread and the abundance of idleness. So let's go down to the middle there. It says, nor has Samaria sinned as much as half of your sins, but you've multiplied your abominations more than they, and they have just and have justified your sisters in all your abominations, which you have done. You also have judged your sisters. Bear your own shame for your sins, which you have committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than you. Yes, blush and bear your shame since you have justified your sisters. Do you see how this ties into what I was talking about this morning? Fascinating. <clears throat> and here, here she thinks she's so pious and religious and she's judging her sisters for what they're doing. And how often do we do that? We point the fingers, but we realize, hey, we got some, well, let's deal with, I got enough problems I need to do with my own. But now look what it says in Ezekiel 16, 60 through 63. It goes on all within context. God says to Jerusalem, look, I'm going to remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. I'm going to establish you to an everlasting covenant. And you shall remember your ways and be ashamed when you shall receive your sisters, your older and your younger, and I will give them to you for daughters. But not by your covenant. It's going to be a different covenant. He says, I will establish my covenant with you and you shall know that I am the Lord so that you may remember and be ashamed and will not be possible to open your mouth anymore because of your shame, and that I am propitiated for all that you have done, says the Lord Jehovah. So what's interesting is now Sodom and Samaria are going to become Jerusalem's daughters. So when it speaks about the daughters of Jerusalem, 
who is it talking about that's doing the speaking? It's, it's the suburbs around. Basically, you have a city and you have their suburbs, but it goes, extends all the way to Samaria and down to Sodom. And then in Isaiah 3, look at this, verse 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are proud, and they have walked with stretched out necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. So basically, we see here in uh, chapter 1, she's been doing all the talking. And then the daughters of Jerusalem respond. But now for the first time, we have the shepherd coming in, and he's speaking. And what does he have to say here? In uh, verse 9 through 11, he's speaking to her. He says, I have compared you, O my love. So we see he refers to her as my love. She refers to him as my beloved. And he compares her to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. I've got a picture here of a company of horses from off the walls of different caves or whatever. But as you can see here, a lot of Pharaoh's horses were uh, dressed up with all kinds of things that were on them. And it goes on to say this, your cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, your neck with chains of gold. We will make you borders of gold with studs of silver. Now, one of the things that we do know about uh, Pharaoh's horses, they were the best, okay? They, they were thoroughbred, purebred, whatever. They were strong. Uh, and let's take a minute and look at Ezekiel 16, 4 through 6. We were talking about the origin of Jerusalem, its birth. And look what it also says. It says, as for your nativity, in the day you were born, your navel was not cut, neither were you washed with in water to supple you. You were not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. No, I pitied you to do any of these to you, to have compassion upon you, but you were cast out in the open field to the loathing of your person in the day that you were born. And look at what God says here. He says, but when I passed by you and saw you polluted in your own blood, I said unto you when you were still in your blood, live. Yea, I said unto you when you were in your blood, live and so here we see they were just a cast off but god loved them so much he took care of them completely as a mother does a child and look what it goes on to say in verse 8 it says now when i passed by you and looked upon you behold your time was the time of love and i spread my skirt over you and that's the word kanaf on the talit it's referring to the kanaf the skirt refers to the corner of the garment just like uh, ruth and boaz And it says, and I covered your nakedness. Yea, I swear unto you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I washed you with water. I thoroughly washed away your blood from you and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you with broidered work, shod you with badger skin. I girded you about with fine linen. I covered you with silk. And then look what it says. And I decked you also with ornaments. You see how this is tying right into the Song of Solomon with what's going on here? I put bracelets on your hands. I put a chain on your neck. Exactly what they were talking about. He says, I put a jewel on your forehead and earrings in your ear and a beautiful crown upon your head. Thus you were decked with gold and with silver. Your raiment was of fine linen and silk and broided work. You did eat fine flour and honey and oil and you were exceedingly beautiful and you did prosper to a kingdom. But see, that's what happened to Israel. They were totally blessed. They had all these wonderful things. God cared for them. He loved them. Now, what's, you know, he talks about how he put a chain around their neck. What, what did God give Israel that was a chain about their neck? Well, look what the scripture says in Proverbs 1, 8 and 9. My son, hear the instruction of your father and forsake not the Torah of your mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace to your head and chains around your neck. So when he's talking about in the Song of Solomon, putting a chain around their neck, he's referring to Torah. He's graced them with all the things of his word. That's what he's gracing them with. And when we think about horses, in Job 39, 19 through 25, God's speaking to Job and he says, Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you make him afraid like as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paws in the valley, rejoices in his strength. He goes on to meet the armed men. He mocks at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turns he back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear in the shield. He swallows the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believes he that is the sound of the trumpet. 
He says among the trumpets, ha ha, and he smells the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. So what God is saying here, he, he sees her as this uh, roaring beauty that has strength, just like he comes back in Revelation on all these horses, you know, and all the saints with him. So uh, he's speaking to her and what he sees her to be, the strength, this powerful warrior. But the problem is he has a divided heart. And he's consumed with all the possessions instead of with him. And so we find, let me go to the next verse here. Now the Shulamite responds and speaks, uh, speaks back to her beloved. And look at what she says. While the king is at his table, you see how she never says how much she loves the king. See, there's just this king, and she says, now the king is at his table. But she says, my spike nerd sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me. Now, myrrh is like a perfume, and this is like a bundle of myrrh. And what they would do, they would wear it around their neck, and the bundle of myrrh would lie right here and would bring out fragrance. And so what she's about to say is all night long she's going to sleep with that bundle of myrrh on her, sending out perfume. It says, while the king is at his table, my spikener sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. And then she says, my beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyard of En Gedi. And so going back here again, here is En Gedi now. It was right here. So she refers to the king. She's saying the king. But when she refers to the shepherd, she calls him my beloved. Now, let's do a parallel. Let's try this into Hosea so we can get these scriptures together. And look at what it says, 1 through 9. Say you unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruamah, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, be there my her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Because see, what she had been doing is all the perfume was going to all of her lovers. It wasn't really going to the shepherd. And it says, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born. See, going right back to Ezekiel, which goes right back to the Song of Solomon. And make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy on her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother has played the harlot. She that conceived them has done shamefully, for she said... I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Does this ring a bell to anybody? Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and make a wall. So even in his love, he doesn't get mad at her and say, fine. Instead, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I love you so much. I'm going to hedge your way up with thorns. I'm going to make a wall that you shall not find her path. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. She shall seek them, but she shall not find them. And then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. And that's what he's doing. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore, will I return and I'm going to take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. So she thinks it's all hers, but it's really all his. Now, I'm going to jump ahead for a minute because I wanted to tie this into the Song of Solomon where we're going to be going. And you'll see the parallels. Look at Song of Solomon 4, 12 through 16. He is speaking to her. And he says, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So just like Lot, instead of like Abraham, who is an open fountain giving out, she's like Lot. These are my goods, my stuff. Nobody can have and ain't going to share. And he says, you're a spring that shut up. You're a fountain, but it's sealed. And he says, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Camphor with spike nerd, spike nerd and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the cheese spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. And then it, then she speaks. So I have this break here because you don't know who's speaking. She speaks, and then she hears what he says. And so she says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, and blow upon what? My garden. But all of a sudden, listen to what she corrects. She says that the spices there may flow out. Let my beloved come into... 
All of a sudden, she realized, oops, she's starting to learn. You're going to see down the road, she's beginning to get the idea. Come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Remember Abraham. But now look at Song of Solomon 5.1, how he responds back to her when she finally gets it. She, he goes, I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey, and I've drunk my wine with my milk. So he comes back to her and says, okay, you're getting it. Okay, this is my stuff that I'm giving to you. But anyway, going back now to chapter 1, I just wanted to bring this verse out because you can see how it ties completely in with Ezekiel. But let's go back to what the shepherd then turns around and says to the Shulamite in verse 15. He turns around and he speaks to her and he says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. You have what kind of eyes? Does he say you have hawk's eyes? No. It's not some mean, penetrating eyes. And a hawk is unclean. See, a dove is clean. Okay? And she has dove's eyes, gentle, peaceful. Isn't it amazing how she really is versus how he sees her? I think that should be a comfort to us sometimes, too. You know, when, you know, sometimes we don't really see the problem we are. We really are a problem. But God still loves us anyway. And he's putting a hedge about us, wanting us to do what? To return. And now think about this. What did he say to her? He said, you have what? So where is he looking? He's looking in her eyes. That's where he's looking. He's looking in her eyes. She's so precious. You have dove's eyes. You're just so beautiful. And what is her concern? What does she look at? She responds, behold, you're beautiful, my beloved. Yeah, pleasant. Hey, look, our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are of fur. What you see, what is she consumed with? The house. She's not consumed with him. It's like, a, yeah, you're great too. And look at this house. Look at this bed. Look at these rafters. Boy, I'm glad I'm going to marry you. I want you. Look at all the possessions I get. Yeah, let's hook up, you know. He's consumed with her and she's consumed with stuff. What's fascinating is at least she says it's what? It's our bed. And then she says it's. Our house is cedar and our rafters are fir. But let's jump ahead a minute to chapter 3, verse 1. She says, by night on what? It's already changes from ours. Great. Okay, let's hook up. It's ours. And then it doesn't take any time at all. And it's now it's mine. We're going to talk more about Song of Solomon 3, 1. Fascinating verse. But in verse 16 and 17, her house is cedar, right? The temple was made mostly of cedar. So again, going back from the the Mishkan, a portable place, to the temple, okay? And you you see it's made of cedar. But how, just like the church today, we're so consumed with being in the four walls and not being out in the harvest. And you're going to see next week how she's consumed with possessions. She's consumed with the house. She's not consumed with him. Now, I don't know if you ever heard Song of Solomon taught this way before, but I think it makes sense, doesn't it? Can you see from tying the scriptures in what this is really all about? So if the musicians will come up, we'll close with the song. And may the Lord speak to each one of our hearts that we could see this book from a whole other perspective than what we've ever seen before and really see God's heart and how much he loves us in spite of ourselves. Amen. Let's stand. Father, we just uh, thank you again so much for your word. We thank you so much for your long suffering toward us. Father, and and our uh, not even half the time being aware you're there, that you've gone. Uh, All too often we're so consumed with uh, the rush of this world, the things of this world, and uh, all the goings on. We don't stop and uh, truly smell the sweet fragrance from you. And we're sorry, Father, for the so many times we've taken the things you've given us and we've just committed idolatry with it. Uh, They become the priority instead of you. And so, Father, we just ask right now that you would speak to our hearts. And if we have any idols in our hearts and if we've been pursuing other things other than you, I pray, Lord, uh, even as Lot's very name means to be veiled, uh, you would remove the veils off of our eyes, that we would get out of Sodom. Father, that we would uh, not be so consumed as they were Uh, fat and lazy, pride and fullness of bread and abundance of idleness, Father. Father, that we would be busy with your kingdom and with your work and what you're doing. Father, that we wouldn't have any time left for self-pity.
Father, I just thank you so much for your word, and I pray you would continue to do a quick work as uh, the days are approaching, Father, that uh, night is approaching where no man can work. And so, Father, I pray right now you would be tugging and pulling on people's hearts. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. I think it's quite fascinating that the tour portion this weekend is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And historically, this coming Monday is the day the floods fell in Noah's day, this Monday. And uh, those that were here last night, the, the writing is on the wall, like many, many take you farson. And uh, I think when the, the floods were falling and, and Noah was righteous, he had the doors open and anyone that wanted to come in could come in, couldn't they? And I don't think they sang 30 verses of just as I am. All right. What I mean by that is this. If you feel like you're not right with God, I'm not here to play games with you and try to woo you. He's the one that's going to woo you. And the days that we're living in, if you're not right with God, you need to come running up here. I am not going to be here to pull you. I'm here to tell you, if you're not right with God, you just best get up here and get right with him because the days are coming when the ark is going to shut. And so, uh, as I say, the ironic benediction, if there's anyone here that just feels like they just want to get right with God and they want to serve him out of a pure heart, uh, feel free to come up here and spend some time around the altar praying. We're going to remain in here. And those of you that want to fellowship, please do. But please keep it down and let's fellowship outside. And uh, today's a good day to come up to the altar and just spend a few minutes uh, before the Lord. Amen. The Lord told Moses that, hey, I really want to bless my people, even though they're rebellious and they turn against me. I still want to bless them. I want to put my name upon them. And this is what he told them to say. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. His shalom, B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, go and be blessed and know God is wooing you. He loves you. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.